Um, I I was in a position where I I felt like it was a you know it wasn't an easy decision, but it was a relatively easy decision um, given wow. the state state of things. So. All right, that was really interesting, and I find her very interesting. Um, I'm gonna reach out to her, Ariana. Um, I'm gonna maybe I'll clip this uh, this bit and send it to you. But uh, I find Ariana Picari's story very interesting. Uh, as I said uh, before, um, I did already interview a couple of weeks ago um, her uh, her old coworker uh, Crystal Ball, and um, I would like to speak more in depth about uh, the primary season, uh, the Democratic primary season, uh, as uh, as through the lens, through the eyeballs um, of a of a producer at the uh, the dreaded MSNBC um, that we uh, that we felt that we were really fighting. Not only were we fighting uh, anonymity, uh, but we were fighting uh, the mainstream media and uh, more directly MSNBC that uh, that was completely ignoring Andrew and uh, even oftentimes quite worse. So I really appreciate um, what Ariana Picari has done. Um, damn proud of you. This is uh, this this is good stuff. Um, there's still good people out there. And okay, I want to go over this uh, story here that we have with Ariana Picari. Uh, Andrew Yang had her on Yang Speaks this morning. And uh, Ariana Picari is a very interesting subject. Uh, she's a longtime uh, producer over at MSNBC. And, um, uh, you know, my audience here knows that I'm a very strong proponent for Andrew Yang. And I was uh, very much a strong proponent and campaigned hard for him uh, for, for a couple of years there. Um, during the uh, the primaries, and uh, and I wanted very much to see him become president in 2020. Now, we didn't get help um, from the media networks, okay? And uh, the the main one that we had problems with was MSNBC. BC. Um, you know, we had a whole boycott M MSNBC going on for uh, for quite a while. Uh, the drama went on for quite a long time to the to the point where Andrew actually got involved and started a, a boycott. And, um, you know, he he then uh, capitulated. And I think that he did that a little too early. And uh, that was actually one of the very first videos that I did. But I digress. Um, MSNBC played Andrew very dirty, and this is not the first time that uh, that we've seen a media outlet uh, do this to a candidate. You can you can take Bernie Sanders, um, you know, as a as a poster child for that, and of course Tulsi Gabbard. She was completely uh, when she wasn't being ignored, she was being basically slandered. Uh, it's unbelievable, but. What happened here is uh, Ariana Picari left because she did not like what she saw from her, uh, basically her industry. And uh, she really railed on MSNBC because that's what she knows. Uh, but she's very quick to point out that it's the entire industry. So I want to read this here from the post. And it's uh, MSNBC producer Ariana Picari slams network as cancer after quitting job. An MSNBC producer released a scathing open letter after quitting her job, accusing the network of becoming a cancer that blocks diversity of thought and amplifies fringe voices. And you're damn right, that's exactly what they do. And it's what the whole mainstream media does, but MSNBC, man, they have a particular flavor of doing this, and they are bad. They are off the rails. Um, Ariana Picari, who worked on The Last Word with Lawrence O'Donnell, do not get me started on Lawrence O'Donnell. Um shared a letter on her personal website Monday accusing the network of letting ratings dictate content. And we all know that this is happening. And, um, and uh, I just uh, interviewed uh, Crystal Ball. And uh, she was over at MSNBC during this time uh, when, when, uh, when, uh, when Picari was there as well. And uh, she told me a little bit about, uh, about what happened to her when she, uh, before Hillary was running, she really went in and she, she did a scathing monologue uh, about why uh, Hillary Clinton should not run um, in 2016, and uh, you know I'm 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 gonna I think I'm gonna play a little clip right here just to uh, just to go over that just the shocking that a journalist is gonna get sat down um, by by their bosses at a network and say hey this candidate's people didn't appreciate that uh, it's pretty shocking stuff so let's go ahead and just cut to that clip real quick and then we'll jump right back into this but just to give your your audience a sense of kind of how some of this works. I did a monologue. It was early in 2015, so pretty early into the primary process, before Hillary had officially launched saying, please don't run. You are the totally wrong person for this time. All your corporate ties, we have this massive problem of inequality. 
you're part of the establishment. Look, I respect you. I respect your service. Please don't do this because you're going to freeze the field and it's, you know, and we're going to risk, you know, we're going to risk a loss here because you're just out of step with what people want right now. So I did this. It blew up. Of course, Fox News loved it as ah, liberal calls on Hillary, whatever. Um, and it was the, after the hat, I got called into, um, you know, one of my producer's office and it's basically like, look, what you said is fine, but the Hillary people are not happy. And if you do any more commentary on her, it has to be approved by the president of the network. And I have to tell you, that's very unusual circumstance. Normally your commentary, the things you write, the editorials you deliver on air are not approved at the highest level of the network. And so look, I would love to say that that didn't impact my coverage, that I totally said exactly what I wanted to say after that, but there's no way that I wasn't influenced by that because you just start feeling like, is it worth it? Okay, I want to say this thing, but is it worth it? I'm going to have to get approval and I'm going to have to go through it and all that stuff. So, you know, it's just one very blatant example of kind of how the coverage there and how the whole approach to that election was shaped. So... Do you think that that was the tipping point? Do you think that, because um, let's be honest, MSNBC um, is batshit crazy. Now, I'm sure you, you think the same thing about Fox News and uh, CNN. Okay, so she's saying very similar things here. And um, as we continue on with Picari here, this cancer risks humans, human lives, even in the middle of a pandemic, she wrote. The longer I was at MSNBC, the more I saw such choices. It's practically baked into the editorial process. And those decisions affect news content every day. Likewise, it's taboo to discuss how the rating schemes distort content, which is obviously true. Or it's simply taken for granted because everyone in the commercial broadcast news industry is doing the exact same thing. And I rail against the MSNBCs of the world. I rail against the CNNs and the Fox Newses of the world. It's the entire uh, mainstream media. And uh, something's got to give. Either... They have to change, which they're not because they're driven by profit, or we have to stop watching them. I can't believe they still get millions of viewers, but it is what it is. But um, conversations like this will hopefully uh, get this out into the uh, the ethos. And those uh, low-information voters, shall we say, that still take um, cable news and even network news, and you know, network news very much, um, at face value, and think that they're out for the greater good and that they are still um, tellers of truth. And they're not. And people have to understand this. And so how this uh, how this started, it was uh, yesterday when Andrew sent out a tweet just saying, Monday on Yang Speaks, longtime MSNBC producer Ariana Picari joins us to discuss her public departure from the network, the forces that shape cable news coverage, and what we can do to improve our trust in media. A lot of people are concerned about this. Thanks, Ariana. And uh, Scott San uh, Santons jumps in, just kind of re reminding us how MSNBC really tanked or tried to tank Andrew uh, by completely ignoring him, by uh, mischaracterizing him, by calling him the wrong names, by leaving him off graphics. It was, uh, it was very, very obvious that they were trying to sabotage his run. And uh, this is something that we just simply cannot let happen again. So... Ariana actually surprisingly um, replied with some very interesting information here. Ariana replies, Actually, I just reviewed my journal. On 425.19, I was told that we were never to pursue Andrew for an interview on our show, along with several others. The list of candidates was dictated, but the reasons for allowing them or not were not explained. And we can all guess who those uh, other candidates were, Tulsi Gabbard, um, of course, Bernie, and uh, it's this kind of stuff that needs to stop. The news media, uh, if they're an entertainment uh, device or show, um, they need to be more outright in saying that because there are millions of people that still, th uh, like I said, take them at face value as if it's real news, and it's not. Stop watching it. And so let's go ahead and get to the interview. Um, I want to uh, see what... What Andrew has to say with her, this uh, this tweet happened after uh, the interview aired, so I'm not expecting to see them talk about this particular uh, instance, but I think Andrew would like to have another shot at it, and ho hopefully uh, he has a... Uh, he has a part due on this, and uh, and and he talks about this particular instance, and uh, and so we can understand exactly what happened behind the scenes with direct regards to him. 
uh, during the primary season. And if he doesn't, I'm going to go ahead and follow up with her. Um, I'm, uh, I've already reached out to her on Twitter, and uh, I would love to have an interview with her so I can uh, really peel back the layers of the onion so we can really understand um, the methodology uh, behind shutting people out uh, when this is supposed to be a democracy. This is supposed to be a fair game that we let the best and brightest shine through and that our media, quote unquote media, doesn't make those choices for us. So this should be a very interesting interview and I would like to get to it. Uh, I want to remind you that um, I, all of these po all, all these podcasts are now uh, available in true podcast form on Spotify on uh, on google podcast soon to be on apple and so um you know please go ahead and feel free to check that out if it's uh, easier to uh, to listen in the car on the way to work or as you're working out or whatever the case is so let's go ahead and kill this and uh, i want to get going on this interview um andrew yang interviews ariana picari <laughs> It is my pleasure to welcome to Yang Speaks the uh, public editor of the Columbia Journalism Review and former MSNBC producer, Ariana Picari. Ariana, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you. And before they get into it, uh, she just uh, resigned in the past couple of months. I don't know the exact date. I should know that. Um, but... This comes in after Barry Weiss left the New York Times in very public fashion, saying that she wasn't satisfied with the way that the paper uh, was headed. Um, Glenn Greenwald less, uh, just left The Intercept uh, last month, and he is, uh, he is slamming them about uh, editorializing the news, about uh, picking subjects uh, for the journalists and not allowing journalists to be journalists, that uh, they are the ones that guide the narrative, and they wanted to continue to go down the road of uh, slamming Trump and being juvenile about certain things. And uh, Glenn Greenwald, uh, he's the co-founder. He's he, he, he started The Intercept. And uh, he did not start The Intercept um, with having non-journalists pick the stories. And that's exactly what started to happen. And so he left in, uh, in, in very uh, dramatic style. And uh, so that's a, that's a continuing story. And that's going to be very interesting to follow. Uh, but let's go ahead and uh, follow up here with, uh, with, with uh, Ms. Bakari. Thank you. I'm a huge admirer, as I know many people are, because you did something that dozens of people imagine doing. Millions of people are wondering why more of it doesn't go on. Uh, but you actually resigned from an MSNBC producer role because you were concerned about the nature of broadcast journalism in terms of fulfilling its function and uh, edifying the, the public. Uh, and I, I want to start all this out by saying that um, you identify issues that are... Um, germane to any broadcast media news outlet, that this isn't like, a, you know, some kind of MSNBC is like singular. Um, and despite the fact that I'm on air on CNN, like I 100% agree with you that these issues are uh, endemic to essentially the medium. Uh, and it's not just an MSNBC thing. So many Americans it is the entire medium, but MSNBC is completely off the rails. They are the worst. And um, so it's it's not comparative to uh, to CNN. CNN is absolutely biased. Um, I can't stand watching uh, CNN, uh, except for, you know, when Andrew is on, honestly. Um, but uh, MSNBC is completely unwatchable. Americans right now are concerned that we are more polarized than ever. Uh, and I think a huge part of that in it's people's because minds of the media. is that uh, the media is not helping. <laughs> the media is not really bringing us together On around purpose. a common set of facts, but instead is uh, kind of separating us into camps. For sure. And I um, that was one of my big concerns when I when I was at MSNBC. Um, I definitely saw and um, the polarization. Um, uh, I was living it in real time and I could see how it affected my family at home in Virginia um, right away. And it's it's weird. I felt like the polarization was almost having um, it was it was having kind of a counter uh, productive <laughs> effect in some ways for for um, MSNBC. But yeah, I definitely I, cons I call it, you know, I some ways call it the gerrymandering of the media, you know, and, th and everyone on the left kind of keeps 
I like that, the gerrymandering of the media. It's exactly what it is. Fox News carves out its audience, MSNBC, goes all the way to the left and to the crazy end and carves it out. Uh, CNN tries to get in that little juicy middle left and carve it out. Uh, yeah, gerrymandering the media. What a great way to put that. It's getting pushed further and further to the left and on the right. They keep getting pushed further and further to the right. And really, it, it's driven largely, not entirely, not wholly, but largely um, by, you know, the financial incentives um, that are required. You know, they Absolutely. gen up their audiences. And um, so, you know, it's being done for profit and by uh, and a very few pe people are actually benefiting. Um, so, yeah, my concerns are are definitely, you know, for um, the democracy um, at large, and, and it plays out in many ways. Yeah. So, so you started out in a different environment in public radio. Uh, and so how was that experience for you? I guess that was relatively early in your career. Yeah, I started, I, you know, right after college, I had a um, crisis of identity, and I didn't know what I was going to do. So I started all first and, and working as a financial advisor for for, for uh, Morgan Stanley Dean Witter. And um, it was actually kind of during that miserable commute around the DC Beltway, I discovered public radio. And over a number of years, I kind of set my sights on public radio because I realized that's really what I wanted to be doing. I just love the craft of it. And I loved um, this, the way that they told stories. I had never had a desire to go into TV. And um, I also didn't really do internships through college because I was, you know, working full time and just a little bit lost in general. So it wasn't until after, a while after college I discovered NPR and set my sights. And I started at, at uh, NPR in, in 2002 and um, loved every day from from the, you know, first minute I was there. So so you were attracted to NPR. And I have to say, when I was out there campaigning around the country, NPR was like its own oasis of news. Like there were folks that listened to it. Mm. Uh, the local I NPR just... stations oh, okay. uh, seemed very... I was going to say, I disagree. The national NPR uh, stuff is completely skewed left. It's uh, it's, it's not uh, fair at all. Uh, but what he's saying is the local NPR stations. And with that, I agree. Uh, they have a lot of freedom, a lot of uh, journalistic freedom to, to follow stories, uh, you know, that match uh, their local environments. But uh, the national stuff is just as much garbage as, uh, as all the other MSNBC. Free. They were very... MSM pure you'd go in and, and they had listeners who really wanted a particular version of both the news and the listening experience uh you were attracted to that and it sounds like you were there from 2002 to 2013 more or less i mean you were doing some other yeah. stuff but it was all uh public radio directed is that right mm -hmm. it's like 11 years or so yes that's correct yeah um and yeah, I mean, I just this morning I was listening. I, you know, I listen to KQED frequently, which is the San Francisco station, and you know, it's it's such a you know pleasure because the you know the local um, public affairs program forum they were they covered um, the local um, uh, drug overdose epidemic and how it's gotten worse through the pandemic, and then they moved on to um, the the new COVID vaccines for another thirty minutes, and it's this long in-depth conversation and things that I didn't even know I needed to know. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's just so much more and so such better information that you can get. Yeah. And, and NPR is supported through um, public funding, um, though, though NPR now has so many listeners and sponsors and advertisers that uh, it's uh, largely self-sustaining and a lot of people have also donated to it. Um, so it's like a combination. Um, and then you wound up at MSNBC, which uh, it seemed like your uh, experience was a, a bit different. Uh, how was the experience? I kind of soul sucking. I kind of came into it with the attitude. I mean, we knew that um, everything was kind of, you know, we knew that ratings, I knew that ratings um, played a part in, in our daily lives. Um, I didn't understand the extent of it. And I thought coming in, I could bring my skills that I had in public radio. And part of that is really trying to find new and interesting and compelling stories and angles and voices. And they would want to, you know, they would be, they would welcome that because, uh, 
I'm going to change media. Yeah, it's uh, it's sad young people, starry-eyed. I uh, think they're going to walk into a place and change it for the better. It's actually sad to watch um, people with good hearts and good intent um, get uh, get basically railroaded by the machine. And it seems it's, uh, ex it's exactly what happened here. And uh, But she gets the last laugh because she, uh, she shows integrity and she gets the hell out of Dodge. In my mind, I felt like one of my big criticisms of p cable news coming into it was the repetition. It was just, I just felt like it was, you know, you're watching the same five or six stories kind of all day throughout the day. So um, I thought that that was an opportunity for me to come in and, you know, make things better. Right. Um, so I, I struggled with that for a few years. Um, I really, I, you know, I tried different types of stories and kind of, I strengthened my pitches and, um, realized, okay, they might not listen to me the first time, but I'll keep coming back and, you know, trying to, to, to sell this other idea or strengthen my argument. Maybe they don't, you know, maybe it's not intuitive why something um, is a good idea. And, over time, I, you know, I, I, I got a little bit frustrated, but um, then started to get at the same time a little bit of seniority. So I was more involved in the, the planning meetings, you know, with the senior producer and the executive producer and or the senior producers. There's usually more than one. And at that point, I realized the extent that they really that the ratings really drove all of the decisions. And it was, it was, it's down to, you know, Management. it's the first thing out of their mouths as soon as you throw out an idea. And they don't necessarily talk that way in the wider editorial meetings with the full staff. It really was in the, the smaller planning meetings. You know, it's the first thing out of their mouths, like how things rated the night before, how they thought something did. And those, those ratings are broken down by quarter hours. So they have a pretty good understanding of what did well and what didn't do well. And so they will track the topics, of course, and they'll track the guests. You know, so if you know, it's if the guest does well or if a guest guest rates well or, or not, they really rely on that um, for almost every decision. So um, it that's it wasn't until the last few years when I, it, the reality um, became you know pretty stark to me, and then you know I wasn't going to be able to fight that fight. You know, there wasn't you know, these people are just doing their jobs and it's all out of their hands. It's out of Lawrence's hands. It's out of Phil Griffin's hands. It's, it's at a higher, way higher pay level. Um, but people like Lawrence O'Donnell, uh, they just continue to cash in and they, uh, basically sell their soul. Uh, if, I don't know if you've ever, ever watched any of his stuff. It's just, it's just terrible. You know, it's just like any of the other stuff on MSNBC. Uh, you know, that's not how they want to be reporting. And, uh, people like her, um, she seems like, uh, you know, I mean, she's very well spoken. Um, she seems to be a good reporter, somebody that wants to do the right thing, somebody that wants to dig into a story. And, uh, you know, too bad that uh, her and Glenn Greenwald didn't hook up. But she sounds like she would be a great opportunity um, for uh, for The Intercept. Uh, but, of course, that's now The Intercept is uh, now going um, by way of regular old um, mainstream media. It's just uh, it's real news, real media. It's dying. And uh, it's it, it's it could be argued that it's dead. And uh, what passes for media is this crap that we have now that still millions of people listen to and watch and believe, and it's a travesty. Where the, where the, the problems are. Yeah, one of the things you said was that, look, these are good people, uh, you know, trying to do good work, but uh, they're put in a position where their job does not necessarily produce the kind of journalism you'd want it to, which is something I completely uh, get and empathize with is that if you put people in a position where their incentives are all steering them one direction, you kind of expect them to end up uh, listening to those incentives. You know, it's like, and if you don't listen to those incentives and let's say your ratings underperform rid of them. Uh, consistently, then someone's going to make a change. And so like, that's the, the race you're always running. It's a job. Uh, like, were there other people that ever expressed any misgiving? Maybe someone else from like a similar background as you? Good question. Yes. Um, those conversations didn't happen very often, but over the last year or two when I was there, there were times when I would have. And that's shocking. Those conversations didn't happen more often. These people, they went to school for this stuff. You know, they, uh, 
they go off into the world thinking that they're going to tell the truth and that they're going to report the news. And they see that it's the soul-sucking company uh, that's all about the bottom line and, uh, and the ratings in 15-minute intervals. I'm surprised these conversations don't happen more often. I mean, Christ, go have a, go have a drink with your colleagues after, after work and uh, talk some shit. Conversations in private with other producers and um, certainly they, you know, with a couple of people, um, they said, I I think we're making things worse. You know, Um, some seem to think that, yeah, what we're doing here is probably benefiting Trump and would, would help him get elected again. The person who said we are a cancer, that is, that's one of those conversations. It was somebody in the building. Um, who? Uh, who is it? And has been in the, the business a long time. So, um, but it wasn't something that people talked about in the open. You know, it wasn't until I went in and sat down, like kind of one on one with them. Um, otherwise, the, the, comp, the, the notion that ratings drive everything, it's just, it's really built into the process. And it's, it's, of course, you know, that's just, that's just what you do. And, you know, most of those people came up through the commercial TV system somehow. And I obviously have a public radio background and none of the editorial decisions I ever made before were based on how it would rate or how big of an audience we thought we would have. I mean, we always wanted a big audience, but, you know, you hope that, you know, what you're doing is compelling enough to hold people's attention. Um, but that's not what determines those decisions. And so for me, you know, it was like, it, it really raked against my nerves every time I heard them say something like, you know, that's not going to rate. And when it's something that I knew would be a good topic, some of the decisions were made out of ideological reasons. Um, but it also kind of drives the division that, that we're seeing and the polarization in this, in the country. So they might be pumping up, you know, um, ideas that Ideology are exciting money. to some people, but then there was never, you know, they don't get excited about the, you know, someone with a more nuanced or moderate take on things. And um, so that, that just kind of keeps driving everybody apart. And there's, you know, you know, there's no sense that, okay, there is some benefit to compromise <laughs> every now and then. I just, I know that that's not a popular idea right now because we've gotten so far away from that, but um, you know, it, it, the, the, in my sense is that it just the it, when you stand back and look at the totality of you know all the w- different ways that the financial incentives affect the content it's just driving us down the wrong path and it's only getting worse the way that i see it good very interesting uh first segment uh, hopefully they get into a little more um in depth about behind the scenes at msnbc um hopefully andrew you know they, they don't just start going down um you know, your beginnings and all of that crap. Uh, I'm really interested in the MSNBC stuff, uh, but we'll skip through uh, these commercials uh, that are that are on uh, Yang Speaks and uh, we'll get to the uh, rest of the interview. You drew a couple of examples in your resignation letter, which I recommend that everyone uh, find and read because I just thought it was so brave Absolutely. and incisive and true. Uh, so thank you for it. And I'm a huge admirer of yours. You did something out of principle that the vast, vast majority of people don't ever do. Uh, and if enough people did what you did, we might actually have a chance. And I don't mean just in media, though the media is a significant part of this, but uh, you know, in, in many different environments where your financial incentives are to uh, just pretend it's okay. Um, and, and a lot of us can sense that it's not okay. So two of the things that you pointed out as uh, programming choices. One was that anything with Donald Trump or a response to Donald Trump rated better. And so uh, you or d- just every, about every cable news outlet covered everything Trump did um, during his 2016 run. And then that became true, obviously, when he was president. Um, and then the inverse of that was that if there was something kind of educational or scientific uh, or deeper, then it would no be time. less appealing or wouldn't rate as well. Right. And so you wound up, wound up with like a bias towards uh, Trump all the time and less about, for example, what a public health uh, official or scientist was saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then before you know it, you have every little thing that uh, Trump does and says sensationalized uh, to the point where you think uh, that he's just some 
this evil person, this this uh, white supremacist racist, and uh, by proxy, everybody that uh, supports him as president that doesn't watch this uh, mainstream media crap is also a racist. And, uh, you know, us Trump supporters, we went through that, and it is um, completely because of the mainstream media. And uh, Trump isn't innocent in this. You know, he likes to fight back. And so they had uh, basically a four-year slap fight, and uh, the end result is quite literally millions of people in this country actually think that this guy is the Antichrist and that anybody that uh, supports him is just insane. And uh, it just shows the power of the media uh, that can turn the people into sheep, and especially these low-information uh, voters. Man, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a bad situation. And initially, when the pandemic started, they are professional journalists and they kicked into gear just like they should. And they were trying to get um, the information they could from scientists and doctors and frontline workers and um, developed a special. Um, Dr. Zeke Emanuel was, you know, on once a week um, to, to cover, you know, focus on issues related to COVID. And after a number of weeks, they discovered that that wasn't rating well. So then it got kind of, you know, started on Monday, Tuesday, and then they pushed it to a Friday because that's a day that they don't care as much about ratings. The doctor covering COVID um, isn't rating our well. our own programming for MSNBC's or Last Word's own programming needs. That, that it was. And then they kick them to Friday where they don't care so much about ratings because everybody else knows that uh, ratings on Friday are just basically dog shit in the, uh, in, in the TV uh, world, especially the TV news world. So you're getting the information, the important stuff um, kicked to the side because they'd rather talk about uh, how racist Trump was that day. It's just sick. It wasn't um, as important. And then it slowly just kind of fizzled out and died. Um, and it was because it wasn't rating well. And, and then you could see the coverage when they were, would do a COVID segment. It really was about just the politics. Um, and they would have on science reporters or correspondents, but they were, you know, pushing them, trying to get them to talk more about the politics than the actual science. And it was through a time when there were a lot, you know, there, I mean, there's still lots of information coming out all the time about the, about the, the virus and vaccines and what we know and what we don't know. And that all of that was, you know, they would try to get to it if they could, or it just wasn't kind of the top line. It was something Not that was important. thrown in maybe as a, you know, an afterthought. Um, the, all of that information really got pushed to the wayside and it, they focused much more on the politics. And it was, you know, the uh, Trump attacking the blue state governors or, you know, what Trump you know, what dumb thing Trump said or didn't say or didn't do. Um, it really focused on that. And I, I understand there's a time and a place for that, but it was just dominated everything. I sure as hell hope Fox uh, doesn't fall into the same thing. Uh, you know that they're going to be giving very unfavorable reporting to Biden, but I hope that they don't go completely off the rails uh, like uh, MSNBC, CNN. Uh, all of them, all of them did. And I, I just am going to be very much let down uh, if they do that. Hopefully they don't. That drove me crazy on the trail too, where it was always like Trump's stupid or inflammatory comment of the day. And then even like I'd be running for president in Iowa, New Hampshire, and they'd be like, Trump said this. What do you think of that? And I'm just like, are you kidding right. me? Yeah. <laughs> like, exactly. Like, like, really? Yeah. And stupid. Yeah. Yeah. It, that, it, that, um, that same idea was pervasive throughout the entire, you know, and it was the last election cycle as well, um, the democratic primary process. You know, if there was a personality dispute that got way more attention than any interesting policy conversation. And I think there were lots of interesting policy conversations we could have had, you know, um, the ideas that you had being the start of it. Um, uh, Tulsi and Kamala, look how much uh, airplay that got. Look how much uh, airplay Kamala got when she laughed at uh, Andrew um, about uh, offering that that basically a giveaway uh, for UBI, which I thought was a great idea. Sure as hell seemed cheesy at the at the moment, but I, I loved it because it got attention to him. Um, but yeah, it's uh, you you can remember back in the primary season uh, that they they really focused upon the the personality bullshit. They didn't uh, they didn't focus as hard on uh, policy as much as they should have at all. Uh, they they got into it with with Bernie um, with uh, with Elizabeth Warren um, as it 
as they reflect um, uh, as Biden and then later as a Bloomberg. And it's just, uh, you know, they, they pick their centrists, they pick their progressives, and they, and they basically pit the personalities after, after each other. It's just uh, crazy stuff. Uh, but then, you know, when it came down to the general and it was Biden versus Trump, I, you know, every, almost every single, I, I know that they tried to, to, to focus on Biden um, when they Nothing could, but focus it on. always turned into a segment about Trump. Trump. You know, they don't want to talk about anything that is negative towards Democrats because that was bad for the MSNBC audience. And the same thing, you know, applied to the Democratic primaries as well. You don't, there just wasn't a full discussion that ultimately benefits everyone. And there was a discussion to be had, and that discussion was about this guy right here on screen. Um, you know, I'm 48 now, and uh, by far, he is the best candidate I have ever seen in my life. Uh, he has the best policy platform I have ever seen in my life. And if the media would have taken the time uh, to talk about policy, uh, people would be more informed. Uh, but instead, like I said, they talk about the stupid slap fights. And um, when uh, when Tulsi kneecapped Kamala, um, all of these things, which, you know, that, that did deserve to be uh, to be talked about. And, and it did work. It got Kamala out of there. Uh, but uh, the personality conflicts and, uh, and just the stupidity um, of, uh, of the things that happened in the primaries when there was real conversation to be had, but they avoided it. So. Um, I think I might have, have, uh, have been part of that or not yes, part of you that. Were. <laughs> yeah. 100%. yeah, I know. I know. I, this is not exactly an unbiased audience I'm talking to right now. But, yeah, but, no, no. I mean, again, like this, uh, this to there. me is more of like a systemic um, uh, no, it, it, um, broad, it, it, broadcast problem. No, it for sure problem. is. And, and it, uh, yeah, I saw it happen. See, man, I wish he didn't. He, uh, could have had the uh, benefit of foresight uh, if she, uh, when she sent that tweet out, he could uh, really ask her about uh, the the contents of that tweet right now. Uh, it would be perfect timing, but uh, sadly, um, she didn't do that. Uh, the journal thing, where basically they weren't allowed to uh, to ask Andrew on the show. I watched it in t 2016, and so that you know, when everybody was, I'm sorry, um, when everyone was shocked that Hillary didn't do better than she did. I. I was frustrated because I was like, no, there were, there were polling numbers out that showed, you know, enthusiasm for her, you know, that were concerning. And, you know, that you never saw that in MSNBC wasn't covering that. So that liberal audience didn't necessarily, you know, necessarily. Well, that's rough. You, you saw know, it on like Fox. that there were actually some uh, numbers that cut the other way that weren't covered. <laughs> there you know, were. That's, that's actually new to me, relatively speaking. <laughs> Maybe everyone knows that already. I, Watch I was Fox, angry Andrew. almost every day in those meetings oh, wow. th through yeah. i mean it's, it, it... look at that feeling of defeat right there just uh headwind you know he's uh he's running uphill the entire time random man running for president and he has this powerful network basically fighting against him and uh man you, you see it in his eyes right there just like shit man it, it, it did it was not pleasant because i i i was at a point where i i could i I mean, I never really bite my tongue anyway, but I, I just could not believe that they were making decisions about, you know, economic segments and, oh, that's not going to, you know, my, not, the day that I gave my resignation, they canceled an economic segment because quote, it wasn't going to rate and they filled it with some other, like, um, you know, not a serious segment. And, um, I, you know, between the pandemic and I, I frankly had issues with how they were covering the George Floyd stuff, um, the, the protests. Uh, again, you know, the way that they covered the protests, they, they wanted conflict. Yes. And they put the correspondence on the it ground shows. in a way that they, they, even if nothing was happening, they wanted it to seem like something was happening. And if there was a ca car that was on fire, they're going to play that video over and over again. Meanwhile, 95% of the protests were peaceful. But I've been in the control room, going back to 2015 and, and the, the Black Lives Matters protests then, people, um, they would monitor all of those protests. They'd have cameras and choppers, you know, they're monitoring the protests. And unless it turned violent, they would not, quote, take it live. You know, they, they wouldn't show that peaceful protest because nothing was happening according to them. You know, it was, it was boring and it wouldn't make good TV. So that, um, that is a type of thing that kind of 
got to me um, through the George Floyd um, coverage. Uh, there were there were other elements. There were there were um, points about the uh, election and election security. Those stories kept getting sidelined. They were not covering them. They'd, you know, I, I was trying to get them to cover the issues. You know, how how are you going to have a safe election? You know, with COVID, and you know, there were lots of groups working on it. They, um, uh, it was really, really, really difficult to get them to cover that. Um, uh, there was uh, op there were opportunities um, when Trump went to Tulsa. There were opportunities to 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 talk about some of the kind of painful history in this country. That was um, on June it, was, it would have been very easy to discuss. Um, the history in Tulsa and the Tulsa riots or Juneteenth and what is all be, you know, what is behind that and why it's so meaningful to the African-American yeah. community. And you can trace the anger that from those news. events Journalism. to George Floyd. It, it would have been, right. it, it wouldn't have taken very in. long at all. You can tie in the past and, uh, and, and what's important to, uh, to current, to the important current events and. Oh, but there were, there was, there was, um, a history there that I didn't know, and I know a lot of talking about smart the same old people bullshit. and journalists didn't know, and it was a perfect opportunity to to share that, and it helps the nation understand, you know, what is happening other than just you know people are angry and and looting the local WalMarts. Right. Well, one thing that a producer, a friend of yours, said that really um, seemed telling was, look, people come to us for comfort, like they don't see us as the news. Uh, I, I thought that was incredible. Uh, and, and there is something fundamental about uh, two different purposes. One would be I'm going to edify and inform. And so I'm going to serve you some stuff that might be not that scintillating. It might be kind of boring. It's like broccoli as programming. And then there's Oops. this other direction that it's like I'm entertainment. Like I'm going to have a certain patter and rhythm and characters and something that you can cheer or boo. Right. Many people might not be old enough to uh, to remember this, but the uh, actual network evening new news broadcast, they would be hella boring, uh, but they were informative. They, they would talk about the important issues of the day, and then they would cut to commercial in the last 30 second, one minute um, spot would be about some stupid feel good story um, that, uh, that that was the sugar and um, the rest of it was the broccoli, exactly what he's saying. And uh, we don't have that anymore, man. It's all uh, it's all just a big old bag of sugar. Yeah, and that was in one of our uh, uh, planning meetings. So that was a senior producer, and um, it's definitely something that you know stood out and something I remembered because you're abdicating your role as a journalist, and that's it's confusing yeah. because otherwise it kind of looks you're like not, a newscast. You're not doing you know, journalism. You have an anchor sitting at a desk, puppets. With, you know, you know the the TV over his shoulder, and you're covering things that are in the news, and so the audience, uh, you know, I realize that you know they there's there's an awareness that MSNBC is. Um, uh, she, so she's basically saying it's like a it, it's a silly set. It's not real journalism. And um, and again, I, I want to go back to uh, to her coworker at the time, uh, Crystal Ball. And uh, I'm going to throw in another cut because uh, I I basically said that the uh, the news programming is uh, uh, something too akin to uh, basically a puppet show. And, uh, and she couldn't agree more. And um, so here, take a look at this, then we'll come right back. Um, you know, there's a theory in, of American politics that underneath the partisan divisions, which are played up a lot and very theatrically, as you put it quite well, on cable news, we've ha actually had really one party rule that's governed by a consensus in different eras. So you can see that it's completely analogous to uh, it's just a show. It's just a show. It's not journalism. More opinionated than the, the straight, you know, 6 p.m. newscast. But at the same time, they're, they, they play it both ways. So that's what I think is really dangerous. When it looks like something that should be reliable, but it, it, it isn't really, then that's, that's to me where the problem comes in. People believe it. I'm pretty sure news is in the name somewhere. <laughs> you know, like there's somewhere in there, like there's the word news. 
Um, right. So, so you have these concerns that are building up over a period of time, um, and then you actually had to bite the bullet and say, "Wait a minute, am I going to keep doing this, or am I going to leave?" Uh, and when you did decide to leave again, I thought it was so courageous because you weren't sure what the next step was. It was it's so courageous. I mean, you think about that. You, uh, you not only leave, but you really light them up. You let them know uh, how you think that it, it's literally a cancer. Not literally, but you know that it's a it, it's a cancer on our on our culture. And uh, kiss your career goodbye. Um, you know, I I don't know what she's gonna do, and I hope uh, nothing but the best for her. And uh, same thing with uh, Glenn Greenwald, Barry Weiss. Um, I hope that they land somewhere where they make uh, more money than they ever could have uh, in these uh, in these horrible mainstream media dinosaurs. And that's exactly what they are. They're dinosaurs, and they're just waiting to die wasn't one of these situations where you were like, oh, I'm going to bide my time and then get some kind of sweet uh, yeah. job offer and this other thing. And then I'll, um, you know, write my letter. Uh, so what was it that actually uh, pushed you to action? Because, again, I'm sure that there are dozens or hundreds of people in media who've at least reflected for a moment on the concerns you're describing but they did not do what you did. And they show right back up on Monday. Um, well, I first want to say I don't blame most of the people in the industry for for not just picking up and quitting their jobs because yeah, the industry is in a crisis. I mean, the last several years uh, they've done relatively well, but um, you know. yeah, I, I left my spot at the uh, in finance because I didn't like uh, what it was doing. I, I absolutely blame the people that work in the machine uh, because without the gears, the machine doesn't work. And um, so I get it. And it's a it's a profit model. And no matter uh, what, it's going to find other gears. Uh, but if you have a hundred uh, Arianas coming out and um, trumpeting the fact that you're watching crap, who's going to watch the crap anymore? Because they're going to know, they're going to understand that it's uh, it, it's it's complete fantasy. And uh, so I do. I blame the people uh, that work at these institutions. Who would? I don't blame anyone either. FYI, I do. I mean, um, where where are you going to go? What are you going to do? Like I, you know. If if you're if you want to get together and start a new medium, uh, you you can start a new channel. You can start like Glenn Greenwald did with the Intercept. You can do that. Uh, you can start a, a business, uh, something with integrity. You can uh, you can write uh, stories that are important, but also uh, you know entertain, for lack of a better word. Uh, but uh, you know you can do that. You you you're not stuck. You're not a victim. I I don't buy that at all. Um, I think what you're doing is you're hurting the country and uh, and blame does fall upon the people that work in these organizations. Stay in some element of the news business, then there really aren't a lot of other places to go. And if you have a family and a mortgage, you know, dependents, it's it's a really hard choice to make. So I don't I don't point fingers at them. But I got to a point where I, I, um, I had been contemplating leaving for a couple of years. Um, I wasn't, you know, I didn't know exactly what I was going to do. Um, I had not pursued other jobs aggressively because I knew I was probably going to want to um, work on this issue some way, somehow, and probably come out. When I posted my resignation letter, I thought I would, I was just kind of putting that down as like a marker in the sand to say this is, you know, where I draw the line and I'm moving on. And I thought that, you know, maybe a handful of people would would respond to it at the time. I thought it was going to get lost to the internet, but I was going to use that just as like, you know, moving forward, you know, I quit the industry and this is why. I didn't expect the, the reaction that I did, but I... Um, because there's a thirst for it because we all know, you know, and it helps to see um, an insider tell the truth. And that's why uh, you saw the 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 impact that you saw. It it really was kind of all together. I just couldn't, you know, I again, we're, we're in the middle of a pandemic and um, uh, I, you know, not a great time economically to, to quit one's job, you know, because it was a, you know, it was a good job and with sure. good benefits. And, um, you know, now I don't have any of that, but Sucks. I have not regretted it for one second. Good um, for you. It's, I don't have good that angry feeling <laughs> in me every day when I wake up. So, Very good. Wow. Um, I mean, yeah, that's profound. Yeah. So you post this resignation letter. You think, well, a few industry types will see it, but it'll just get lost the internet. And you said that you weren't expecting the reaction. 
that it got. Um, what was that reaction? I mean, I certainly know that I saw it and said, like, wow, this person's awesome. I need to reach out. Uh, but like what? Uh, but I don't know what you experienced at that point. Um, so, yeah, like what happened next? Well, it was interesting. You know, um, one of the first outlets that picked it up was Fox News. And of course, they <laughs> they helped prove my point for me by yeah. saying, you know, MSNBC producer writes scathing letter Do about the, um, the divisive nature of that. her ne- network, you know, and, and, and Without they took out all of the context, uh, which is what they do, media. you know, and, it, and it, it's something that kind of drives up the, you know, that their audience and Both sides. Um, uh, and for for clicks, you know, to to to, to get well, attention. each side loves it when they can point out that the other side is somehow yeah, uh, a- you know absolutely yeah bad or wrong. Yeah. Um, so I got a lot of response. Um, I got thousands of. Uh, notes and you know whether it's that it was through my personal website which until then had you know like <laughs> you know maybe two visitors um <laughs> um the the piece itself has been read over three hundred thousand times on the, the actual website but oh. then there was like there was lots of coverage elsewhere and um people wrote to me on twitter facebook uh instagram and through my website i, I have thousands of notes from people across the spectrum you know uh, certainly i'll, I'll a lot of people um, on the right who read the Fox piece, you know, they were, you know, cheering me on. I think they think I might be something different, but um, um, people on the left also, and former producers in the industry and academics and grandparents. And presidential candidates. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. They were like, you know, but there were there was this sense that like, thank you. Like, we know that something is wrong. and. I swear to God, guys, if she ends up uh, on Fox News completely being this uh, <laughs> this batshit crazy um, on the right person uh, that, that completely changes her style, I am going to lose all faith in humanity. I'm sure that's not going to happen, but hell, you never know. A lot of people, they're all like, you know, we don't know why it's gone. I don't think that'll happen. She seems like a very down-to-earth person that made a very, uh, a very conscientious decision. I don't think that's going to happen. Um, so as bad as it is, and this helps explain that. Um, and you know some people will say you know what are you naive like to think that ratings don't drive you know the news business or corporate media or whatever and, and I, my reaction to that is what are you naive to think it's not doing damage to our lives every day you know um Damn so but in ge- i just got like it, it was really heartwarming the um uh, across the spectrum i got really thoughtful kind notes thanking me for for what i did i thank you everyone should be thanking you ariana because we all can sense uh that something is going wrong and you you were one of the only brave souls who came out from within one of these organizations and said yeah you're not imagining it (laughs) it actually is going wrong and it's not good for uh any of us the country the democracy our states of mind um well uh I thank my mom for like <laughs> giving me a place to live in the meantime. So I, oh, I don't that crank sucks. through my savings too much. But wow. um, I, I was in a position where I, I felt like it was a, you know, it wasn't an easy decision, but it was a relatively easy decision, um, given wow. the state, the state of things. So. All right, that was really interesting, and I find her very interesting. Um, I'm going to reach out to her, Ariana. Um, I'm going to, maybe I'll clip this uh, this bit and send it to you. But uh, I find Ariana Picari's story very interesting. Uh, as I said uh, before, um, I did already interview a couple of weeks ago um, her, uh, her old co-worker, uh, Crystal Ball. And um, I would like to speak more in depth about uh, the primary season, uh, the Democratic primary season, uh, as, uh, as through the lens, through the eyeballs um, of a of a producer at the uh, the dreaded MSNBC um, that we uh, that we felt that we were really fighting. Not only were we fighting uh, anonymity, uh, but we were fighting uh, the mainstream media and uh, more directly MSNBC that uh, that was completely ignoring Andrew and uh, even oftentimes quite worse. So I really appreciate um, what Ariana Picari has done. Um, damn proud of you. This is uh, this this is good stuff. Um, there's still good people out there, and uh, and if we get uh, 
if we get more people like her, um, you know, the, the, the country stands a chance, journalism stands a chance, and, uh, and we, can, uh, we can all get off of each other's throats. Um, but uh, for now, I appreciate you watching this, and um, don't forget, uh, if you want to see it in podcast or hear it, I'm sorry, in podcast version, you can catch it on, uh, on Spotify or wherever you, uh, wherever you get your podcast. Just look, uh, do a search for T4Y Podcast. And uh, and it'll be there. All of these new episodes will be uh, will be uploaded immediately. So uh, thanks for watching, and uh, you have a good night.